strike, a strike against rising fuel costs and shortages. There were scattered incidents of violence from coast to coast and some arrests. The Pennsylvania National Guard was put on alert. A federal judge in Cleveland ordered independent truckers to stop interfering with steel deliveries. The strike is nowhere near 100% effective, but it has interfered with deliveries of a number of commodities, including food and fuel. In New Jersey, the trucker strike added to the gasoline shortage. It prevented many service stations from taking delivery of their first February allocations. On back roads, small groups of truckers tried to stop those others still working. The strikers put up picket lines at four of the state's larger oil terminals, cutting off all deliveries from Shell, Amoco, Chevron, and Hess. Greetings, I'm Mike Parkhurst. What you've just seen is a preliminary look at what truckers can do when they're mad as hell and aren't gonna take it anymore. This is a true story of the trucker shutdowns, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And what the shutdowns helped us to do to improve and revolutionize the entire trucking industry. Thanks for watching. How did the first trucker shutdown really happen? What caused it? Well, here are the facts. In the summer of 1973, in the country of Chile, 45,000 owner-operator truckers shut down in protest to the communist dictator Allende, and they were followed by women, housewives, carrying and banging their pots and pans, which was called the Pots and Pans Brigade. They caused a complete revolution in the country of Chile. The dictator was assassinated, and they got a new government. Unfortunately, not a good new government. So I used that, frankly, as a means to tweak the truckers' interest in what they could actually do. And in the October issue, of my magazine Overdrive, I explained what the truckers in Chile did. And then the next issue, the November issue, I had my great artist Paul Geppner draw a big machine that I called a Vacander Truckin' Men. Awaken Trucker Men. And that explained what we had done with my magazine and my association, Roadmasters, and the Independent Truckers Association several years before with a steel hauler strike, which we helped to organize. So by tweaking the truckers' interest in the power that they had, hidden power, I thought we should explain it and then we could have a shutdown if necessary. So on December the 3rd, 1973, a trucker and his wife, John and Susie Glendenning from Indiana came to my office and I told them, unfortunately, we're gonna have to shut down. They were so thrilled they asked to use our phone to call some friends back east. They did and said, guess what? 
Overdrive and Roadmasters are going to organize a shutdown. The word spread like wildfire. We're trying to put on a little pressure uh, to get someone to notice our point of view, get someone in Washington to realize what's happening to us and maybe help us a little bit. It seemed to me at the time that it would be irresponsible to just call for a big nationwide trucker shutdown with no end in sight. So I thought that it would be appropriate to have a very short two-day shutdown, which we scheduled for December 13 and 14. The reason I picked those days was because it was the anniversary of the planning of the Boston Tea Party. And that was my little inside joke, you might say. But a two-day shutdown would show Congress that truckers were serious about shutting down. And also, a very short two-day shutdown would not interfere with the Christmas deliveries. I didn't want little Johnny to be mad at truckers because his bicycle wasn't delivered either by truckers or Santa Claus. So we had a two-day shutdown which frankly was a little bit more than two days because some truckers shut down earlier in December when they heard the word. But basically we had a two-day shutdown that was a shot across the bow for the Congress. And then we placed a big ad in the Washington Post explaining the needs of the truckers and we hand delivered reprints of that ad to every single member of Congress, all 535 of them, everybody at the DOT, and the 11 ICC commissioners, so they would know that we were serious, that January 31st, coming up, a bigger, longer shutdown would happen. Unfortunately, as we all know, Congress does not react to problems. They only react to a crisis. So, in spite of the warnings, in spite of the proof, they did nothing. New Jersey gasoline stations were already in trouble. Lines were long at the few stations that were open. Because of the truckers' strike, the gas situation was becoming even worse. In Ohio, where a lot of the earlier protests were centered, fewer trucks than usual were on the road. Many of those travel in groups of three or four to protect each other from striking drivers who might try to stop them. In Akron, truckers were given police protection. Some who stayed on the job, most of them drivers for big trucking companies, said they sympathized with those on strike, but they also said their bosses had told them, either work or lose your job. The economic effects of the strike are not yet serious, but they're building. In Cleveland, drivers for a big supermarket chain walked out closing down warehouses. If the strike goes on, 80 supermarkets in Ohio may run out of food. In Southern California, the independent truckers set up their blockades last night. Los Angeles County was the focal point. They rolled their rigs into several large diesel terminals and parked. They were still there today, although truck traffic on the highways looked normal. The protesting drivers say they'll stay until they get lower fuel prices and higher speed limits. There was no violence and station operators generally were sympathetic. So the stations stayed closed, blockaded, all day. The drivers, with nothing to do, stayed close to their trucks. From time to time, leaders showed up to give them progress reports. Ontario 500 truck stop this morning was shut down. A spokesman claimed the Los Angeles shutdown was 90% effective, with 250 independent owner-operators taking part. But thousands of trucks were still on the road. Although the blockades made it hard for the other drivers to find fuel. Good evening. Federal and state officials and representatives of the independent truckers of this nation have met in Washington in an attempt to end the truckers' protest that has now spread to 26 states. The protest has already created violence on the highways, unemployment, and the shutdown of businesses dependent on trucking. Much of what the truckers desire simply cannot be implemented without congressional action. A return to work can now prevent a national economic calamity that would, by its impact, adversely affect every truck driver as well as every other working man and woman in this nation. 
The return to work now by the independent truck drivers would prevent the spread of violence. That could only lead to an adverse public climate that would make it more difficult for government officials to cooperate with the truck drivers in achieving their goals. The truckers' initial response to the moratorium request was not favorable. As the talks went on in Washington today, Ohio's Governor John Gilligan ordered 900 National Guardsmen to duty patrolling state highways and protecting the truckers who are still working. In Pennsylvania, since last Wednesday, there have been 14 shooting incidents and 63 reports of damage. In Pennsylvania, state officials today doubled the number of National Guardsmen on duty. They watched highways and overpasses in bitter cold weather. Traffic was light. The few trucks that were moving traveled in groups for protection. There were reports of scattered gunshots, and one driver was forced to abandon his rig. It could get worse tonight when truck traffic would normally pick up. This evening, the Pennsylvania National Guard is out in double the numbers of the past few days, waiting, waiting to see what will happen as truck traffic resumes and the first big test comes of the trucker's strike. In Illinois, despite scattered reports of violence, the truck strike remains relatively calm. This truck stop is one of a few still open in the state. Here, business is down about 80%, and right now there are no plans to close the stop despite the business losses. In Indiana, few trucks are on the road. The drivers say it's virtually impossible to get diesel fuel. The strike has been that effective. This stop was open until this afternoon. It closed after only two drivers had stopped for fuel in one 12-hour period. Police patrol the stop on a regular basis. The truck drivers who are staying here during the strike say they want no violence. So far, there has been none. The truckers say they will stay off the road until the government meets their demands, which include lower fuel prices. It's ironic that this stop raised its diesel fuel prices five cents per gallon just today. William Saxby, the new United States Attorney General, said today, governors, city and county officials must move against trucker violence before hundreds are killed on the highways. He said this handful of truckers is not going to bring the country to its knees, but he added, if the governors don't have the guts to face up to the situation, it will get worse. It's had its effect on the delivery of gasoline. Some schools in remote rural areas today had to close because they couldn't get gas for their buses. Also, filling stations in many areas reported long lines. In Washington, Federal Energy Chief William Simon said one way to eliminate the lines and panic buying is for motorists not to buy gas unless they need at least $3 worth. He didn't suggest what to do if the station won't sell that much. He did say he might make a minimum sale mandatory when and if Congress gives him the authority to do so. Some of the longest gas lines have been in the heart of the East Coast's biggest refinery district, in and around the city of Elizabeth, New Jersey. Supplies are so low there that the mayor has set up New Jersey's first distribution plan, like Oregon and Hawaii. Motorists with even-numbered license plates get gas on even-numbered calendar days and vice versa. There appears to be no consensus among striking truck drivers on that tentative settlement worked out yesterday in Washington. There were more trucks on the road today, and some industries which had been on the brink of closing got fresh supplies. But many truckers say they won't accept the settlement, and violence, which has accompanied the shutdown from the beginning, continued with new incidents in 15 states. Here in Washington, leading administration officials met with President Nixon to review the situation. We have reports first from ABC White House correspondent Tom Jarrell. The president, under criticism for not being more personally involved in the trucker's strike, met for 45 minutes with federal officials who have been in the front lines of the negotiations. The so-called interagency task force has the dual assignment of implementing terms of the tentative agreement and punishing strikers who may have broken the law. Chief negotiator William Ussery is hopeful the truckers will buy the deal they've been offered, and he reported limited progress today. Energy Chief William Simon, who's also promoting the settlement, reported his office is moving to stop price gouging and wants 100 percent of the truckers' fuel needs met. Simon, however, will not yield on the truckers' number one demand for a diesel price rollback. While bureaucrats and sellout artists were huddled around other politicians in Washington, back in Los Angeles at the Overdrive Independent Truckers Association headquarters, we had a communication headquarters where we were mapping out what was happening all over the country. 
we were getting five to 6,000 telephone calls a day. We had two round-the-clock operators taking calls, taking notes, and writing up what truckers were saying, including the fact that there were 200 fully loaded oil tankers anchored off every single port city in the United States waiting for the prices to rise. Yet Bill Simon, who became the Treasury Secretary, said basically, oh, we can't do anything about the prices. Yes, they could. Attorney General William Saxby said his office is investigating a possible antitrust conspiracy among some strike leaders, and he has the FBI investigating 379 criminal cases. Saxby warned that even drivers who have returned to work are still subject to possible punishment, and those who continue to strike will be closely watched. So it is a carrot and stick approach, emphasizing the good points of the agreement, hoping other drivers will follow suit to those who have accepted, and pointing out that criminal acts which have made negotiations and the strike effective thus far will no longer be tolerated. This is Bill Zimmerman. If the 75 or 100 truckers who trudged through the snows of Capitol Hill today are typical, there are quite a few drivers who will not go along with the tentative settlement. Led by Mike Parkhurst, the editor of the trucking magazine Overdrive, these men say they don't intend to roll until the four demands Parkhurst mentioned are met. The rollback of prices, an immediate ceiling on the price of all fuel, not just diesel fuel, but all fuel, uh, a public audit of the oil companies with the progress of the audit made public and full allocation of fuel to the truck stops. Those four major points have been the ones that the oil companies have been resisting through the mouth of William Simon, who acts like a pimp for the oil companies. There has been no agreement. The shutdown continues. The White House, through Mr. Ussery, has been lying to the public. And if you don't believe me, just ask any of these truckers and they'll tell you. Parkhurst claims there are 100,000 drivers who feel as these men do. This is Stephen Gere at the Turnpike toll gates at the Ohio-Pennsylvania border. Truck traffic here today is running 5% heavier than yesterday, but it's still 50% below normal. Last night, 100 trucks passed through these portals as compared with 400 a year ago. During the daylight hours, 800 went through. Last year, it was 1,400. Hanging over the Pennsylvania Turnpike today was a National Guard helicopter and a question. Will the independent truckers approve the tentative agreement so that traffic can return to normal? Returning to Pittsburgh today was the most visible of the truckers during the Washington negotiations, and steel haulers President William Hill seemed to lack the confidence in a settlement that he showed yesterday. It was uh, more or less put to us that it's a final offer by the government. So I think that's something that uh, all the truckers will have to consider. However, uh, like I say, we don't represent all the truckers in the country uh, as far as FASH goes, but... Uh, there's uh, most of them uh, will have to make up their own minds. That's all I can say. When the shutdown was only two days old on the third day of February, Bill Hill, one of the biggest sellout artists there was, said, we've accomplished what we wanted and let's get back to work. But truckers were not because they weren't paying attention to Bill Hill and his very small organization of steel haulers, which he claimed were huge, but were not, because he, like other sellout artists, just lied. The status of the truckers' strike today was still pretty much up in the air, at least from the point of view of many truckers. But in Washington, the White House indicated it will not budge from the agreement worked out yesterday between government negotiators and truckers' representatives. Dan Rather reports. President Nixon is holding firm in his rejection of demands from truckers for a rollback in the price of diesel fuel. This was made clear as Mr. Nixon met at the White House with top advisors for a review of strategy in the trucking situation. 
W.J. Usry, Mr. Nixon's top labor troubleshooter, claims truck operations increased 20% in the past 24 hours and predicted that they may be back to full scale within the next few days. We have met the truckers' basic demands, claimed Usry. Energy Chief William Simon said that use of federal troops is not being contemplated, thus contradicting his own deputy who said yesterday that the government was considering using U.S. soldiers to keep highways open. Attorney General William Saxby came out of Mr. Nixon's office today warning that the Justice Department, including the FBI, plans to get tough. We are now uh, setting up a further investigation into the antitrust activities and have uh, identified 10 locations where we feel that uh, FBI can further identify antitrust operations. We're identifying the organizations, their leaders, how they got to be leaders, Many times they are self-proclaimed leaders. At the Capitol, about 75 people claiming to represent truckers demonstrated against what they say is a pro-oil company tilt to President Nixon's policies. The truckers insist that most big rigs won't roll until and unless crude oil prices are rolled back. Pennsylvania Governor Milton Schaap, himself a former trucker, played a large part in negotiating the truckers' settlement in Washington, and he vowed to go out into the field to explain it to the strikers. He started today at a truck stop in Bartonsville, Pennsylvania. You've made a giant step forward. You've got a solid foundation upon which to build. We're, we're not getting a thing. That. We can get all the fuel we want now as long as we're willing to pay 40 and 50 and 60 cents a gallon for it. Yeah. We can buy fuel on Sundays. Uh, there's nothing. There's absolutely nothing in there. This 5% surcharge, for us to roll back now the trucks uh, at this cost that it's froze at now, we're absolutely finished. We, we want to roll back and we want the Nixon administration to tackle the oil companies and then we'll put our trucks back on the road. Till then, we're not doing it. We heard when you were in Washington, and I want to know this for a fact, because you're, you're an honest governor. Did you try to get to see Nixon? Yes, I saw Did he see you? I saw General Haig. I did not you see You didn't see Nixon, right? And a crisis like this, one governor out of 50 states doing all this work, this is a sin for the Nixon administration to sit behind closed doors. Even though government officials said there was some increase in truck traffic today, it's impossible to tell to what extent the strike agreement has been accepted or rejected. This because the truckers include many factions and not just one big organization. But there were reports today of widely scattered acts of violence against truckers still driving. In East Liverpool, Ohio, two trucks were shot at while moving north on State Route 11. And in one of them, 48-year-old Lawrence Huff was hit twice in the abdomen and critically wounded. Whether the strike ends right now or continues, it appears that a meat shortage will occur anyhow in some areas. When even one trucker tells a reporter, especially a reporter for a national news organization, that progress is being made, that will be broadcast out to millions of people and other truckers watching television, listening to the radio or on the CB will assume that progress is being made that will make them restless. They'll start looking at their truck with Google eyes again, and they go back on the road. And that's what happens when even one trucker sells out the dreams and hopes of thousands. And that wraps up our talk about the 1974 trucker shutdown. The trucker shutdown of 1974 was like a raging river carrying boatloads and barges of ideas and letters and actual bodies going into Washington, putting pressure on the Senate to support legislation that we got introduced by Peter Domenici, Senator from New Mexico, which was shortly co-sponsored by Senator Hubert Humphrey of Minnesota as well as Senator James Buckley of New York, a liberal and a conservative. Interesting. And therefore, we were able to get more and more senators to support the legislation in the Senate. Even before many of the senators endorsed this legislation, President Jerry Ford jumped on the bandwagon very quickly because he was a big supporter of the independent truckers. Jack Kemp, the former quarterback 
who was one of the top conservative members of the House, introduced the legislation in the House. And so we got legislation moving forward in both the House and the Senate. At the same time, we published in overdrive letters from big shippers who were tired of being tied to the regulated common carriers. They wanted to ship their products by the independent trucker. And they said so in letter after letter after letter after letter to us, which we published. So we got 25% of the Senate to endorse and support the move to let the independent trucker taste that freedom that he had so long wished for. In 1977, the Interstate Commerce Commission finally caved to the pressure and granted 90-day complete authority to any independent trucker hauling anything going anywhere. That was part of the total push for deregulation that finally did occur in 1983. Threats of a nationwide trucking strike over the fuel problem rolled closer to reality today as drivers blockaded truck stops around the nation. In Washington, a convoy of 18 trucks paraded down Capitol streets, escorted by police. The rigs departed without incident, leaving a spokesman to press their demand that the government roll back the high cost of fuel and guarantee truckers' allocations. The leadership of the Independent Truckers Association is split over calling a strike. And as Don Webster reports from South Holland, Illinois, some independents already are warring with company drivers. It turned out to be a confrontation of trucker versus trucker, independents against company drivers. More than 100 rigs surrounded one of the nation's busiest truck stops outside Chicago, blocking any access to or from the station. They were protesting skyrocketing diesel fuel prices. We just can't afford to buy the fuel and operate. We just aren't making any money at all, man. Because these guys are burglars outright thieves because one station can sell for 73 cents and this donkey's got to have 83 there's something wrong other drivers had pulled into the truck stop to sleep and they awoke to find themselves trapped inside a ring of trucks there were hurried phone calls to explain the delays i got me blocked in front and back the action angered some trapped truckers so much that some attempted to dismantle a highway barricade so they could drive through and continue on their way the police stopped this most of the protesters were independent truckers who buy their own fuel. They haul most of the nation's perishable items, fruits, vegetables, but the truckers didn't say anything would spoil because of the delay, yet. From the lunch counter to the fuel pump and right down to what you have to buy yourself, all we're doing is adding to inflation. The whole thing, the whole ball of wax is just out of control. Fuel is up around 30, 35 cents a gallon. I burn about 800 gallons. That's close to $300 around more just for fuel, but my revenue ain't up a dime. Truckers claim that on the one hand, they're paying more for diesel fuel, but the rates they charge are regulated. To help out, the government now allows truckers to pass along increased fuel costs on 10 days notice instead of 30 as before. Truckers say that's inadequate to keep up with prices, which appear to increase every time they stop for fuel. Independent truckers were urged today to pull their rigs off the road immediately to protest diesel fuel shortages and the 55 mile per hour speed limit. The head of the 30,000 member Independent Truckers Association predicted consumers would begin to notice food shortages within a week. It's not immediately clear how many truckers will heed the call. For two weeks, the nation's highways have been the scene of demonstrations by independent truckers. Slowdowns, blockades, shutdowns, even some violence all part of a loosely organized strike dramatize the short supply and the rising price of diesel fuel. Well, today the government moved to do something about it. Two weeks ago, independent truckers brought their rigs into Washington to emphasize their calls for relief from high fuel prices. Today, the Interstate Commerce Commission responded. Effective today, the regulated carriers for whom owner-operators are employed must, and I emphasize must, fully compensate the owner-operators for increased fuel costs 
in the amount of 5.6%. What that means is independent truckers can now tack a surcharge of 5.6% onto their loads. It's designed to offset diesel fuel prices, which have gone up an average of 21 cents a gallon since the first of the year. The ICC claims the surcharge will add less than one-tenth of one percent to the cost of consumer goods. Washington hopes the moves will defuse calls for a nationwide strike, but a spokesman for truckers says the action amounts to little or no help. I think that independent truckers are smart enough to realize that the ICC is trying to sell them out and if they listen to this garbage from the ICC about a 5.6 or 6.2 percent surcharge, that is just another crumb off the table. This is Richard May, and the truckers I talked to at this truck stop outside Chicago agree. Stop and think about it, fuel. It seems to me like it's went up 10, 15, 20 percent here just in the last uh, year. So how do you figure 5.6 would compensate for that much? Al Bibby stopped driving his truck three weeks ago to protest high fuel costs. He says he'll remain shut down because the ICC surcharge hasn't done anything to reduce the price of fuel or to guarantee an adequate supply. I think it's a petty token. It's not going to do anything at all to really compensate you for the actual cost running down the road. It was just 10 days ago that protesting drivers shut down this truck stop and despite today's ICC announcement, angry drivers say that that kind of disruptive tactic will probably continue as they attempt to make their point with the government and the American consumer. Although the surcharge is not expected to significantly increase food prices, a continued driver protest could. Slow deliveries have already raised wholesale prices for some perishables, and shoppers may soon be paying those increases at the supermarket. Good evening. The Interstate Commerce Commission moved today to get striking independent truckers back to work. The ICC offered them help so they can pay the high fuel prices that, among other things, prompted their strike. We have two reports. First, Richard Roth in Washington. ICC Chairman Daniel O'Neill said freight surcharges up to 6.7 percent can be immediately added to trucking company bills as long as the trucking firms pass the increase on to independent drivers who have to pay for their own fuel. According to the ICC, diesel fuel prices have risen more than 30 percent since the start of the year. O'Neill said there is no question the surcharge would add to the cost of consumer goods shipped by truck. But he said he hoped today's action would convince independent drivers to go back to work. And at one point, he addressed himself directly to them. The ICC has done with this action just about all it can legally do to give you the tools and to give you the, your company the mandate to enable you to recover the increased cost of diesel fuel. But Mike Parkhurst, editor of a trucker's magazine and a spokesman for some independent drivers, said the ICC action isn't enough. Independent truckers are smart enough to realize that the ICC is trying to sell them out. And if they listen to this garbage from the ICC about a 5.6 or 6.2 percent surcharge, that is just another crumb off the table. Whatever it does to operating costs, both sides agree the surcharge will have no effect on the availability of diesel fuel. Independent truck drivers scoffed at the government's surcharge offer, calling it not enough. They still want increased and uniform highway weight regulations and higher speed limits, not just a partial recovery of their fuel costs. Well, if they bring it up 30 percent, like the fuel went up, uh, it would be fine and dandy. But 5 percent would even cover our uh, the first part of the, the uh, raise on the fuel. So what are you going to do then? I'm going to stay shut down until she so we'll get it right. And in Wisconsin, where these drivers have been blockading truck stops, the surcharge is not inducing them back to work. I can't see it. Would you, would anybody in their right mind settle for a 5.6% increase in their wages 
and their costs are running 25% over and above what they were on the 1st of January is about what it amounts to. In Iowa today, the state highway patrol was ordered to keep open gasoline terminals that have been blockaded and picketed by truckers. At one terminal, some truckers were arrested for impeding traffic. Such disruptions have spread to about 30 states from coast to coast, including New Jersey and Alabama, where yesterday the National Guard was called out to protect trucks. At large northern produce terminals, some shortages are starting to show up, raising the threat of higher prices. No cauliflower or California peaches arrived in Chicago today. This truckload of Florida corn was three days late because of diesel fuel shortages and blockaded truck stops along the way. It's just going to be interesting to see what's going to happen next week. And if uh, the situation stays the way it is, like it is today, I think it's going to be pretty rough. But for the most part, there's been no widespread cutoff of food supplies. However, there's concern that if the protest does not ease soon, supplies and their prices could be seriously affected. Senate Majority Leader Robert Byrd said today that President Carter is failing to provide the leadership the country needs to solve its energy problems or to ease the gasoline shortage. He urged Mr. Carter to resubmit a standby rationing plan to Congress. There were long lines of cars again today at stations all over the Northeast. One dealer in Hartford, Connecticut said there's hardly a drop of gas in the area. If misery loves company, there was consolation today as more Americans spent their Saturday in the gas line. In Boston, cars queued up for blocks. Nearly 60% of the stations sold out or closed down by late afternoon. Most of the open ones severely restricted the amount of purchase. So the angry refrain you used to hear in California and Washington is now being sung in Boston as well. I think the thing that kills you is the $5 limit. You have to wait in one line for $5 and then another line for another $5. If you could just go once, wait a half an hour and fill it up, it's not as bad. In New York City, too, the squeeze is on. All week, the station hours have been growing shorter and the gas lines growing longer. Only a fifth of the area stations opened at all today. In Pittsburgh, the situation is deteriorating so fast, 75% of the area stations expect to be completely out of gas the entire last week of June. But so far, the Washington area still seems to be suffering the most, and the town that would normally be riveted by summit politics thinks and talks of little but gas. About 60% of the stations opened this morning. Most were quickly snarled with gas lines, most closed by early afternoon. But official White House cars had no trouble filling up at their garage, where the pumps are discreetly hidden from motorists passing by. Local service station officials say today's lines were as bad as the lines in 1973 and 74. Tomorrow, there won't be many lines, but that's no cause for hope. With only 6% of the area stations planning to be open, tomorrow there will hardly be any gas at all. Diane Sawyer, CBS News, Washington. There were long lines of trucks, too, in some parts of the country, convoys of striking independent truckers. The drivers are protesting the high cost of diesel fuel and are refusing to carry goods to market. One convoy snaked through Florida today, and Bonnie Ginsberg of WTVT has that story. Independent truckers from around the state formed a hundred truck convoy from Tampa 40 miles north to Dade City to protest rising fuel prices. The vote to strike was unanimous despite the Interstate Commerce Commission's move yesterday to grant them some economic relief. Even before the convoy began, most of the truckers said they would vote to strike. They said the 5.6% raise granted yesterday by the ICC just wasn't enough. That wouldn't be worth commenting on. Uh, 5% doesn't even meet the cost of living. They give Social Security 7%. Why can't we match it? We should get our 40% now, and we should get another 7% before the end of the year to meet the cost of living. You can't survive at this rate. Though most of the convoy was conducted peacefully, there was one incident of violence. A Hillsborough County deputy tried to stop the lead truck for driving too slowly at 10 miles per hour. When the truck wouldn't stop, another deputy fired a shot into one of the truck's tires. Let's move them on down the road like we're supposed to. That's all we ask. We want to move quietly and peacefully. Will you move this truck, please? We'd like to move it into Dade City. 
The Hillsborough Sheriff's Office says it will issue an arrest warrant on Monday, charging convoy leader Austin Sands with impeding traffic and violently resisting arrest. When the truckers arrived at the rally point, they demanded diesel prices rolled back, higher fuel allocations, and antitrust law exemptions so they can set rates across the board rather than each driver setting them for himself. The unanimous vote to strike is for an indefinite period of time. We're going out to just as long as it takes, regardless of how long it takes. It's commonly called a gasoline tax increase. It's supposed to pay for road repair and job creation, but there's a lot more to the bill, including other special higher costs for truckers. The reasoning, their heavy rigs cause a lot of road damage. But as Ned Potter reports, a lot of truckers complain that higher cost is one pothole they just can't take right now. This truck pays $1,700 a year in road use taxes. That's what Owen Finnegan says. He also says that if it goes to $4,000, he may not be able to pay anything. The way the business is right now, it's slow. And uh, uh, with this tax and everything, I, I won't be able to do it. It's almost impossible. The Surface Transportation Assistance Act would increase gasoline taxes by five cents a gallon, which many truckers say they don't like but can live with. It just gets rougher every year, what can I say? For trucks over 25 tons, though, the administration would raise road use taxes more than 130% by mid-1985. We're not out to put them out of business. We just think they should step up to the plate and start paying for the tremendous damage they did to our highways. The bill is meant to create 300,000 highway construction jobs, but truck companies with 40% of their capacity already idle say the loss of trucking jobs will offset that. In our industry, uh, the common carriers are dropping out like flies because they, uh, they just can't uh, cope with it anymore. Those objections voiced by the trucking lobby apparently have been enough to help slow the bill down in Congress. And in Los Angeles yesterday, the Independent Truckers Association was urging more than talk. If they pass this legislation, there will be, and we will endorse, a nationwide truckers shutdown. Clifford Cossey has been hauling diapers from Missouri to Texas. And I think it's here uh, road use tax now, just a big rip off the trucker. Paul Ingraham is driving furniture polish from Los Angeles to Chicago. I'm not making a cent. I'm just keeping up. And Owen Finnegan, trying to make ends meet, says higher taxes will bring him to a stop. Thousands of independent truckers pulled their rigs off the road today to protest a five cent a gallon increase in the federal gasoline tax and a proposed hike in highway user fees. No injuries have been reported, but there were outbreaks of sniper fire, arson, and rock throwing across the country. Ned Potter has the story. Where in God's name does he think that us people out here, the poor working slobs, are going to get the money to pay these taxes? Why, they ask, should we foot the bill? Truckers say they will pay 33% of the highway taxes, even though they are less than 1% of the highway traffic. We know that the Congress, until the truckers shut down, won't do anything to help the truckers. The strike was set to start this morning, and its leaders said perhaps 75,000 drivers had joined. We're going home. We're going to shut it down. On a typical Monday, 100 drivers would be parked at this truck stop. Today, there were a dozen. The prices keep going up and we just can't afford to drive. Dennis Outson was driving, calling the strike poorly timed and poorly organized, but he also said he was scared and heading home as soon as possible. My family and stuff is more important than maybe getting a brick through my window or getting shot. This truck had two tires shot out near Erie, Pennsylvania. Other damage was reported in Michigan, Maryland, Alabama, and elsewhere. The effect of a total shutdown would presumably be felt very quickly. Independent truckers claim they haul 90% of the nation's fresh produce. But the administration said no strike would force it to withdraw the new taxes. User fee, in our judgment, is equitable. The heavy trucks are doing the bulk of the damage to our highways. The Independent Truckers Association has announced no timetable, but many strikers, poor already, admit they can't hold out very long. Violence spread on this second day of a nationwide strike by independent truckers. One driver was killed and at least 11 people have been injured in the protest over scheduled increases in the gasoline tax and highway use fees.
There is growing concern among law enforcement officials as the strike has apparently spawned violence in at least 17 states. The worst was in eastern North Carolina, where a 34-year-old trucker, George Capps, was ambushed and killed during the night near Newton Grove. The police say a sniper with a high-powered rifle fired a single shot through the windshield, striking Capps in the neck. He was killed instantly, but the truck, loaded with general merchandise, continued down the road for a half mile before hitting a ditch. Other truckers traveling through the same area reported hearing shots fired at them, and one showed police his evidence. I heard the noise, and I just kept going. I, hell, I was scared to stop. Incidents were also reported along the Pennsylvania Turnpike. In one, a 14-year-old girl suffered a fractured skull when a brick, apparently thrown at a passing truck, came through the windshield of the car she was riding in. Just 70 miles away, five trucks were vandalized. At Brigham City, Utah, a sniper apparently fired shots from a railroad overpass, striking a trucker in the side. After three hours of surgery, he is listed in satisfactory condition. In Washington, the president of the Independent Truckers Association says he condemns the violence. We don't want any violence. Uh, that is what we've been trying to say. If truckers would just shut down, I'm sure that the violence would subside. As word spread of the violence, fear spread among the truckers. Somebody laying in the bushes ambushing a guy out here trying to make a living. Pretty rough. Is that why you're stopped? Because that's that... right. That's right. I park right here. I'm gonna stay here until the sun come up. The North Carolina Highway Patrol is also suggesting that truckers drive only during daylight hours. And the non-striking Teamsters Union is recommending that all of its drivers travel only in convoys. Bruce Hall, CBS News, Durham, North Carolina. Early morning, and in Chicago, this produce market is as busy as usual. Back it up! High to your left! Left! This is where the impact of a truck strike would be felt first and most. I'd have been home yesterday, but I wouldn't unload me. There's had so many extra trucks in here for the, uh, getting extra stuff in for the strike. If the shutdown were total, say wholesalers, there would be spot shortages by next week. But the shutdown is not total. Out of 100,000 independent trucks, strike leaders say 50% may still be rolling, and the government says more than 80%. I know I shouldn't be out here going, but on the other hand, I just got too many bills and that, so it's, it's a rough decision right now. Tax is way out of proportion, it really is. But then again, who else can pass it on to the consumer more than the truck? In California, the nation's largest agricultural state, food producers contacted by CBS News said they saw no strike impact yet. Fifty strikers began a convoy in the Imperial Valley near the Mexican border, hoping to attract support. Mainly, one of the points that is not being accomplished here is letting the public know that in the end, it is they that will have to bear this extra expense. Big truck lines and the Teamsters Union have both said they will not support the strike. Independents make up one-third of the country's long-haul traffic. But they say they carry 90% of the food and half the steel. This steel distributor in Philadelphia, heavily dependent on trucks, says that if the strike goes all week, he'll have to lay off his employees and close down. Then I feel that they're certainly not going to accomplish anything. By the same token, they're hurting the small businessmen. Suppliers of many goods say they need the truckers. The rails can't take up the slack at all. But so far, they report, there hasn't been much slack. The independent truck strike continues tonight, and it is more violent than ever. What's more, fruit and vegetable shippers are warning that shortages are developing, and consumers can expect to pay higher prices. Roger O'Neill is keeping track of this bitter strike. Florida vegetable growers are demanding an end to the four-day-old trucker strike. The winter harvest is underway, but shippers say they can't find enough independent truckers to drive the produce to markets in the north. There's no shortage of trucks bringing fresh produce into Chicago's South Water Market, but there's a reason for that. More money. More money seems to be the answer. Monday, we paid $1,800 for a load of lettuce from California to Chicago, and then Tuesday, we had to pay uh, $250 more. The railroads are picking up some of the freight the truckers are no longer carrying. Federal officials say there's been a 25% increase in fresh produce moving from the south to the New York area by rail. And there's been some increase of fresh foods coming into the Chicago area. But the railroads will not be able to pick up all of the slack if the strike continues and more drivers stop driving. This driver says he doesn't intend to stop and is getting tired of being intimidated. 
In Medford, Oregon last night, a trucker was forced to stop driving when someone in a passing car threw a Molotov cocktail at his windshield. Violence has been reported in 38 states, but the worst is in Pennsylvania. A 60-mile stretch of the Pennsylvania Turnpike has been dubbed the combat zone by truckers. I looked over, and you could actually see the gunfire coming from the woods on the eastbound side, shooting at the westbound. South Dakota Senator Larry Pressler says the continued violence is hurting the truckers' chances of getting proposed higher truck taxes rescinded. Uh, I think that the activities of Parkhurst and the violence and so forth, without a, a list of demands, is hurting their cause in Congress rather than helping it, and I'm for the truckers. The Independent Truckers Association says while it is against the violence, it has no plans to call off the strike. But Independent Truckers' strike moved into its fifth day today with more violence against truckers who are continuing to drive. Today, however, authorities began escalating their battle to stop the attacks, as Roger Peterson reports. National Guard helicopters are patrolling the highways in North Carolina. The choppers will carry infrared equipment for nighttime surveillance. And in Pennsylvania, the National Guard's been put on alert. I'm here uh, this morning to reiterate our commitment to see that all possible action is taken to combat the violence and vandalism. Three to 4,000 Pennsylvania Guardsmen can be ready on two hours' notice. In Washington, President Reagan said the government won't yield to those responsible for the violence. To let a small percentage of any group of people in our country, by the use of murder and violence of the kind that they've used, change the laws of this country would be the worst precedent that we could set. Among the violent acts reported today, another truck gutted by a firebomb near where a truck terminal was damaged by fire outside of Warren, Ohio. Strike leader Michael Parkhurst again denied his independent truckers were responsible for the violence and repeated an offer once made to other truckers. If you would get all of your members to pull off the road for one hour, we'll call off the shutdown, and Mr. Kiley said no. Is that offer still good? Yes, that offer is still good, but I'll bet you they won't do it. Parkhurst was right. He says he called for the strike on his own initiative. Well, the action that he should take is to call it off in his own initiative, and he can do that in the next hour. National Guard helicopters today patrolled North Carolina highways, and the Pennsylvania National Guard was on standby alert. Those actions came on the fifth day of the sometimes violent strike by independent truckers protesting scheduled increases in gasoline taxes and highway use fees. Mike Parkhurst, head of the independent truckers, said the strike would halt if every truck in the country joined a one-hour symbolic shutdown. But the American Trucking Association, which represents the large regulated companies, called even a symbolic protest inappropriate. Meanwhile, Attorney General William French Smith said the Justice Department would consider federal prosecution of violent acts connected with that strike. There are reports today from New York and Florida that shipments of produce by independent truckers were picking up. It's still too early to tell what effects the strike may have on consumers, but Wyatt Andrews explains the financial road already is rocky for the truckers. It makes tears in your eyes. If you got something that you don't, can't pay for, and I'm sitting still, you can't make that pay for There are hundreds of Bob Longs on strike today out of fear. Fear of bodily harm if they drive, fear of financial harm if the strike continues. But I ain't going back though. things get better. I ain't hungry yet, but I might get hungry. They are drivers who rent themselves and their machines for an average of 80 to 90 cents a mile. Independent truckers who claim they were struggling long before Congress imposed a list of new taxes. According to industry estimates, the average federal tax on a large truck is now $1,750. But by 1985, there will be new taxes on truck tires at $45 a year. The federal excise tax on the price of a new truck goes from 10 to 12 percent add $240 a year. The nickel a gallon fuel tax, add $730 a year. And the federal highway use tax, the big increase, add $1,310 a year. The total, even considering the $100 in truck taxes Congress repealed, an additional $2,225 by 1985. That makes independents like Jack Ferguson afraid, afraid that another $2,000 in taxes could be the breaking point. If I thought I could keep on and make an honest living in what I'm doing, I wouldn't be saying nothing now. But I, I, I just don't see no way. Chuck McClanahan has a similar story. He had a good week last week, but claims he only netted $100 after expenses. When it comes down to the bottom line, we're making less than minimum wage. 
per hour. It's going to cut our income almost by 20 percent. Many of these independents do not believe the strike will solve their problems. Instead, they are convinced that December's lame duck Congress did not understand the impact of all these new taxes and that truckers will win some tax repeals once the new Congress does. In Pennsylvania, they're calling it a combat zone, that stretch of the interstate highway which has been raked by gunfire and violence during the independent trucker strike, which continues tonight. Roger O'Neill, who is still on this story, reports tonight on the steps that Pennsylvania authorities are taking to prevent more violence. In Pennsylvania, the National Guard has been put on alert. Truckers driving through the state have organized their own convoys because there has been so much violence here. 45 more cases reported to police last night. More than 300 strike-related incidents, including 69 shootings on Pennsylvania highways since the strike began. The governor, Dick Thornburg, put the guard on alert and also ordered out extra state police. That extra duty assignments be made so the state troopers can maximize patrols in the evening and early morning hours when the greatest number of incidents have occurred. The state police are watching overpasses and staying close to truckers on the highways. Local police are on the interstate highways too, making sure their presence is known. The truckers who are still running say they appreciate the show of strength. Every sees a state trooper near a truck going down a highway, no matter where it is, they won't do anything. Naturally, you feel better about that because, uh, you know, you know you're better protected. Members of the Pennsylvania National Guard have been told to stay near their phones in case they are ordered on patrol. Pennsylvania has 12,000 guardsmen. The violence on the highways has forced Richard Steinbeck to shut down his small trucking operation in Toronto, Ohio, just across the border from Pennsylvania. It's extremely frustrating. I personally want to work, I need to work. Steinbeck was the principal hauler for the Toronto Paperboard Company next door. It has been forced to shut down and lay off 100 workers. The governor didn't say how much more violence there would have to be before he would call out the National Guard, but truckers who are still driving say they like all the protection they are now getting. The leader of the independent truckers on strike today offered to call it off if every truck in the country would stop rolling for one hour as a symbolic protest against higher fuel taxes and highway fees. However, major trucking companies turned him down. Independent truckers have reached a crossroads as the strike by thousands of drivers heads into its second week. We have a report from Ned Potter. We are reaching the turning point, say several authorities. The strike is either about to be felt or it's about to fizzle. For many drivers, the strike is becoming a test of resolve. I can't stay out too long. I've got a piece of equipment back at home that I'm starting to get behind on payments on. But... Mike Parkhurst, the man who called the strike, offered Friday to call it off if all truckers would join in a one-hour protest. Today, Parker said he doesn't worry about defectors. The only time that truckers get attention is when there's a shutdown. In the meantime, more scattered violence. In Ohio last night, a driver was in serious condition after a sniper fired at his convoy. First thing, I think I'm just going to turn around and go home. Pretty, a lot of sick individuals out there, a lot of cowardly sick individuals, if you ask me. The government said it expects the violence to drop, and as bank accounts do too, it expects many of the strikers to hit the road again. The key word in the 11-day-old trucker strike may be independent. Thousands of independent truckers pull their rigs off the road January 31st to protest scheduled increases in gas taxes and highway use fees. But in spite of the violence, many drivers stayed on the road. Today, the head of the truckers group called the strike over. But Ned Potter reports not all the independents are ready to go back to work. Members of Congress signed a letter pledging not a repeal, but a review of the new trucking taxes. And Mike Parkers, the man who called the strike, said that was enough for him. We are officially calling off the shutdown of independent truckers and asking them to go back to work. Truck stops and shippers had already reported traffic returning to near normal, but many drivers complained that Parkhurst, having failed to get real action, had wasted their time. The 1983 shutdown was the most difficult one to organize because it was based on a huge increase in truck taxes that hadn't been put into effect yet. The media seldom mentioned how much the highway use tax increase would be. They just focused on the small nickel a gallon. It sounds small, but when diesel fuel sold at 80 cents a gallon, that nickel 
increase meant a 6% additional expense in fuel. It was difficult for many truckers to shut down over something that hadn't happened. The headache pill doesn't work instantly. What truckers did was a major help in winning other goals such as killing the restrictive weight and length laws. The 1983 shutdown also kept truckers on the political map, which a few months later allowed deregulation. Freedom at last. The free enterprise eagle was finally allowed out of its cage, able to fly wherever it wanted and build its nest on higher branches. Those truckers who did shut down in 1983 were an unappreciated army. They lost the battle, but won the war. I don't really think that we got anything accomplished. And groups in some parts of the country said this settlement only strengthened their determination to stay off the road. In the end, the strikers were undone by scattered cases of violence and by other modes of transportation filling in and by other trucks continuing to haul freight. They did cause some disruption, but they did not bring the country to a stop. I'm glad it's over with. At least I ain't got to go through an under overpass now and worry about something flying out of it. <laughs> and everybody ready to go? Let's give it to them! At the Ohio State Capitol, 60 strikers held one last demonstration and said they were ready to go back to work. One driver said, it's frankly a losing battle. The 11-day strike by the independent truckers ended today when it became obvious the best they could do was a promise of a congressional hearing on truck taxes and new road users fees. Here's Lee McCarthy. Flanked by congressmen who wrote a Dear Colleague letter asking Congress to listen to the truckers' complaints, Independent Truckers President Mike Parkhurst called off the strike. We are officially calling off the shutdown of independent truckers and asking them to go back to work. Parkhurst was calling off a strike that had been winding down for days. What support was left was quickly eroding this morning. In Minnesota, truckers rallied to show their support for the strike while saying they were going to go back to work. And in Ohio, they were saying the same thing. You know, no money coming in, uh, got a baby due this month. And, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, it, it hurt. In Washington, Parkhurst and the officers of his association had to find a way to end the strike while saving face. The congressional letter was the best they could do. Many truckers will have their rigs rolling again in a few days, but during the strike, some of them lost business to the railroads, and it could be weeks before they know whether they'll ever get it back. The truckers' shutdown helped me and help all of those valiant truckers to push Congress to support legislation that would give the independent trucker or owner operator the right to compete with the big fleets that had a monopoly on almost all the freight in the country. So we got in the House Jack Kemp to introduce the legislation. In the Senate prior to that, we got Senator Pete Domenici from New Mexico to introduce Senate Bill 2271, which would give the independent trucker the right to compete, something that had been my almost lifelong dream. As we got more and more truckers to write to their congressman or woman, we got more and more support, one after the other. In very short order, we got 25% of the United States Senate to support this legislation, which was the door opener to complete deregulation, which finally happened in 1983, when Ronald Reagan was president. So the shutdown brought to the forefront the actual truckers that Congress didn't know about, that the media didn't care about, and which then also supported and influenced the start of several big trucking movies, which we'll talk about 
shortly. One of the problems in trying to organize a trucker shutdown is the fact that people will come out of the woodwork with no organization whatsoever and say, hey, I'm a leader. Well, there were many of them. A guy from Ohio, Lester Salzgiver, who claimed overnight that he had 20,000 members. No, he didn't. He didn't have any. A small group out of Missouri with two members said, oh, well, we want to do this. Who's we? Two truckers? So that was part of the problem. Bill Hill, a guy from Pittsburgh who claimed he was a nationwide leader of some sort, but he wasn't. But nevertheless, the government used people like that. And Bill Hill is one of the worst shutdown sellout artists that there ever was. After three days, only three days, he said, it's time to get back to work. We've accomplished all we want. No, we hadn't. It takes a week or 10 days for a shutdown to really work and sink into the economy. But they're not used to dealing with the media. They don't know how the government will lie and why the government will lie. So they are pawns. In 1983, there was one trucker from Nebraska that the Department of Transportation brought into Washington, paid his way there, put him up in a Hyatt hotel, and he said, oh, we don't care about this tax. We can afford to pay it. One man. So the government, through the Department of Transportation, said, well, you know, uh, what the Independent Truckers Association is saying uh, is uh, countered by other truckers. And that's the way sellouts happen, unfortunately. As we said, this documentary is bringing the good, the bad, and the ugly to the viewers. Unfortunately, the ugly was very ugly and completely unnecessary because a couple of truckers got shot and killed. There was a young farm boy in the state of Maryland who was shooting at trucks. He was blamed on truckers. But unfortunately, there were a couple of deaths and it was terrible that that happened. But some truckers can let their tempers get a hold of them and boom, too bad. It was too bad. That's the ugly. The bad, of course, was that there was a slight, a slight black eye on the trucking industry. But not completely, because before the American people even knew why truckers were shutting down in 1974, the Harris poll showed that by a pretty good margin, the American people supported the truckers. And then, of course, we have another addition to the good portion of what the truck shutdowns did. And that's the stimulation of movies. One of the good things that came from the shutdowns was the creation of several trucking movies, which had not occurred until the shutdowns. For instance, right after the first shutdown in 1974, we had a TV series called Moving On with Claude Akins and Frank Converse, BJ and the Bear, the trucking hit movie called White Line Fever starring Jan Michael Vincent, and Convoy starring Chris Christopherson and Allie McGraw, and then shortly after that, the first two Smokey and the Bandits. So we had several trucking movies that came along, including, of course, a low-budget movie called Thunder Alley, all because of the shutdowns. Nobody had seen any trucking movies except one for many years until after the shutdowns. So that's part of the good that happened. Don, you were a company driver back in the early 60s. And then, I understand, you became an owner-operator in 1973. That's right. But, 
But did that give you the right to haul anything going anywhere yet? Well, not really. Not really. It, uh, it come after that. What came after it well, and what helped it? Well, it's because of your doings, knowing what to do, they got rid of the Interstate Commerce Commission, which was controlling all the trucks. What was the matter with that? A government agency controlling the trucking industry. What's wrong with that? Yeah, but any time you get government involved, you got nothing but troubles. Well, of course, that's easy to say, but after all, we have to have a, an organized trucking industry, don't we? Well, we did have it. We did have it. There was regulations that we had to abide by, even as an independent trucker. Were you involved in the shutdowns then? Yes, I was. And how, in your opinion, do you think the trucker shutdowns helped the independent trucker or the whole trucking industry? Oh, it helped tremendous. It helped tremendous. Because people didn't realize how important the independent truckers were to them. And it helped some of the big fleets to grow, too, because of deregulation. Isn't that true? That's right. So you were heavily involved. What sort of things did you do that you can talk about? Well, I was got to be a member of the Independent Truckers Association, and in 75 I had a trailer painted up supporting the independent truckers. In fact, the first trailer in the United States painted up which I was so proud of the organization that I went all the way out to bring it out to the public. Well, that was very nice. You, you actually, at your expense, had your trailer painted supporting the Independent Truckers Association. That's right. And how did that help? Well, it helped a lot because people seen it all over the country and they began to ask questions and I'd tell them what what we were accomplishing. And they wanted to join up too and become part of the organization. How many total miles, if you know, how, that you drove a big rig? In oh, your life? probably close to four million. Four million miles? Yeah. Did you ever have an accident? One time I got put into a swamp in Indiana. It wasn't my fault either. Passed a woman and she got nervous and she whipped out in front of me and threw the front end over and down in the swamp I went. <laughs> no alligator got you though. No, no alligator, thank God for that. Well, maybe they would have been afraid of you. <laughs> yeah, it could be. Now those shutdowns that eventually helped to get the trucking industry deregulated, who was fighting deregulation? It in was, the trucking industry. It was the independent truckers that were doing it. No, but who was fighting, who was against deregulation? Well, the big, big carriers were uh, against the American Trucking Association. And now they love it. Yes. So they were not very foresighted, were they? No, they couldn't see very far ahead. Too bad. That's right. And of course, Probably the railroads did not want deregulation either. Oh, no, no. Yeah, so basically everybody was against deregulation except the people that understood freedom and free enterprise. That's exactly right. In other words, the independent truckers. That's right. Which never got any kind of public knowledge or acknowledgement until the shutdowns. That's right. And then we got a lot of publicity. Once the independent truckers got recognition, uh, one of the things that I understand you did was you got to meet President G Jerry Ford. I did. And he autographed a picture of your truck. That's right. Yeah. Well, that never would have happened probably without the shutdowns. Oh, I know it wouldn't happen. So, how did you find Jerry Ford? How, how was he to talk to you? Very pleasant. He had spoke at a convention, and then I went upstairs of the room he was in, and I told the security I wanted to talk to him. And so then he came out, and I said, President Ford, I'd like to get your autograph. 
He said, sure. I said, this is the first rig painted up in the United States supporting the independent truckers. So he gave me his autograph. And then when he walked out, he had security all over with him. And he stepped out of line about 12 feet and came over and shook hands with me before he left. Well, that must have been quite a moment. It was. Very okay. honorable moment. Not too many truckers you get to meet a president. <laughs> no, that's right. We're here in Wabasha, Minnesota, the headquarters town of California Overland, one of the nation's oldest trucking companies started in 1925 by the current CEO, Russ Meyer's grandfather, Lloyd. We're going to be talking with Russ about some of the problems of the trucking industry, some of the future of the trucking industry, and why perhaps there are so many problems in the trucking industry, which of course the public doesn't care about until they shut down and don't deliver the goods. Russ, why don't we take it from the top? Pretend I'm a high school student and I want to learn about the hours of service that I have to put in as a trucker. Good question. First of all, when you look at hours of service, you're talking about fatigue. That's what we're trying to fight as an industry. We don't want fatigue. And in order to not fight that, we have to abide by the federal guidelines that are established by the federal DOT, which allow us to run 11 hours per day and then take 10 hours off. And then when we're done with the 10 hours off, we can run our 11 hours. The problem comes into life is when that 11 hours comes and you are fatigued. It, it, uh, it's very hard to do your job. When you're fatigued, you're not, uh, you don't have all of your uh, senses like you do when you're alert. No. I feel that we have to have the driver driving the truck when he's alert. And in order to do that, uh, we, used to, we used to have a split log where a, a driver could drive five hours or six hours or five hours, sleep for five or six, and then continue till he achieved his 10 back then, which is now 11, and then he could take another five hour break. A lot of times that helped a lot of drivers stay alert through this 11 hour period. That makes more sense. Well, it does. And uh, when, you look at, when you look at being alert, and, and, and the federal DOT is, it wants us to be alert, there are options to, to, to say, okay, I can, I can see that this driver is very alert because we can put a camera on their face in the cab which shows us when they are becoming fatigued, your face changes. Uh, we also, when we're fatigued, we make bigger swoops with our steering wheel. We have a device that can measure these swoops. If they start getting bigger, we know the guy is fatigued behind the wheel and he, he needs to get off the road, regardless of whether he's been on the road for one hour or four hours. All of this fatigue stuff, to me, we're trying to make our highways safer. And if a, if a driver is fatigued, regardless of whether he's driving legal or not, he's very dangerous on the highway. So. Well, but why do you think that the DOT rules have allowed a driver to drive for 11 straight hours and not take hours off to sleep or take a nap? Well, they feel that uh, their guidelines do not allow that. You, you have to take that 10 in one break. And in years past, they used to allow that to be split up. but. What I, what I think is these people are trying very hard to, to make the rules, to establish the, you know, the rules, but what we have is people that have never driven a semi establishing the rules, and the people that have to, to abide by them don't have any say. Now, my thing is let's put five truck owners and five drivers in a, on a table somewhere and say, now, what can we do to, to eliminate fatigue in our, in our, on our highways? It sounds as if the DOT rules are punishing drivers more than helping them. Well, right. The law states that once we reach our 70 hours, we have to spend 34 hours off duty on the road. Uh, and they call it a restart. And that punishes drivers that, that want to be home. They might be 10 hours from home and they could do the restart at their home, which would be time with their family in their own bed at their own home and, 
and all these things. And, and right now, it doesn't uh, take into consideration the driver's needs, his personal needs, and his family, and, and these sort of things. And of course, they could take that 34 hours or be mandated to take the 34 hours at a rest area, and the state law may say that a truck can't stay there for more than eight hours. So what does he do? Well, first of all, it's very boring to be stuck in a truck for 34 hours without anything to do. And that's why the word punishment or whatever you want to call it, inconvenience, punishment, it's, it's pretty accurate because it's, it's just not much fun. Now also, how many places allow you to sit for 34 hours in one spot? and allow that to happen. Truck stops don't like it either because they want trucks moving in and out of their truck stops. The rest areas, they like you to spend your eight or 10 hours, they're fine with that, but after that, they want you moving. So it's not just cut and dry, it's simple. My thing is, I know from driving, I drove uh, 500,000 miles, that I could drive 10 hours a day for 80 days in a row, as long as I got my 10 hours sleep every night or 10 hours off duty every night. It has nothing to do whether you need a restart or not. The restart should be at the driver's discretion at his home. It should be mandatory at maybe 10 days or whatever, but it, it shouldn't be connected to hours because it, causes, it, it punishes drivers, and we're losing a lot of good drivers in our highways today because they just can't take it. And what are some of the other big problems that the trucking industry has today besides the hours of service? One other big problem today is our, our engines refuse to run. We break down a lot with the, with the new guidelines for the EPA. It's, it's tough on us. We have, we have sensors. We have many things right now that shut these trucks down on the highway with no notice because of the tight, tightening down of the EPA. And I, I understand that. And our trucks are burning cleaner than ever. But they keep tightening it down to the point where we can't make them operate. Secondly, I feel a driver should make more money for what he goes through in life to be a truck driver. It's a tough job. We can't only afford to give them X number of cents per mile, and it hasn't kept up with the times for what they go through. Now, when I say what they go through, they have to drive through inclement weather. They have to drive through traffic jams. They've got time schedules. Everything is laid out ahead of time, and if anything happens at all, it's, it's on the driver. Uh, Snowstorms, uh, that's why the, I feel in 11 hours, if you hit a snowstorm and you can stop for five hours, and wait for that storm, snowstorm out and then drive your other uh, hours for the day, you'd be money ahead. We'd have less accidents. So therefore, what you're really saying is some of the EPA rules that have cracked down on the engine manufacturers uh, can force a truck to stop in the middle of a snowstorm at, say, zero degrees, yes. and there's no food or help anywhere around. Right now, trucks with no notice can just shut down, and they do it all the time. Not only is it dangerous in a, in a, in a fog or snowstorm, snowstorm situation, but it, it, it's hard on the driver, it's hard on the customer, the load is late. You know, there's a lot of reasons to, you know, to keep these trucks running now. A truck that's a year old shouldn't be shutting down on the highway, period. You know, and we have it all the time. And it's, it's, it's punishing me and it's punishing the driver. It's, it's, it's way too tight right now. How do you think these rules that are, in many cases, punishing drivers, how do you think these rules, or will these rules, ever be changed to be more satisfactory and more practical? I don't see it coming. One of the reasons that you see all these five-hour energy drinks and drinks that'll give you five hours of energy so you can stay awake is because many people that drive truck are tired. And when they should be sleeping, they pop one of those for five hours and they're supposedly alert, but you're not alert. You're kind of a shaky alert. I'd rather have the guy sleeping, and then when he's done resting, I'd rather have him on the highway. And today, in today's world, we don't have that. We have, a, we have my computer, the Qualcomm telling him when he can drive, and we have, uh, for the people that run the log books, the log books tell them when they can drive. My point is, a driver's body should tell them when he's alert and when he should drive, nothing else. And you have to, if, if, if uh, you can't leave it to the driver, then let's put technology in the cab that allows us to, to manage the driver in that form. Not energy drinks, not 
things that are supposedly going to make him a good driver for that 11 hour shift when he's tired, I want him resting. Period. There's nothing like sleep. And the sleep has to come when your body says, let's sleep. Okay? Yes, I'm an owner-operator, but I don't own this truck. My father-in-law does, uh -huh. and they were involved in a serious accident, so I'm the only truck running, and if I don't run, I can't rebuild the, the bottom line. I'm an owner-operator, but I've been in transportation since 97. Okay, for a while. You know, there were a number of trucker shutdowns back in the 70s, 74, 79, there was another one in 83. The first two dealt with uh, phony oil shortages that was supposed to be taking place, the last one dealt with tax increases. Is there anything today that bothers you that you would complain about in regard to your job out there on the road? What applies to one doesn't always apply to the other. The idea that all laws are created equal and everybody obeys them equally doesn't seem to apply to trucks or the drivers that have them. That'd be the only thing I'd have. Hey, I, I guess I'm wondering, uh, as far as fuel, the fuel costs, they've gone up quite a bit. Have you been compensated enough with the difference in the high price of the fuel with what you're being paid? It's a roller coaster. This is not a job. This is a lifestyle. This is a lifestyle. It's not a job. I don't consider this a job. I'm in paradise every day because I get out here and get to do what I want to do. Do you have any complaints today that would justify the potential of another shutdown? Well, you're, never, you're not going to get another shutdown because you can't get everybody together. Back then, if we had all united and got together then, we wouldn't, I don't think we'd have the problems we have today. What kind of problems do you think we have today? Oh, just everything in general. Everything in general. I mean, they, we go to places and we get treated like we're scum of the earth. And it would be nice if someone would sit there and go and really look at what truck drivers go through. I mean, I don't think anyone really knows what the life is out here on the road. I really don't think they do. What's the worst thing about it? The worst thing is, is I do a lot of shopping at Walmart, and now we get thrown out of Walmarts because well, what it costs to go eat at a truck stop. I mean, it used to be you could go in ten dollars, you get an all-you-can-eat meal, and you get some change back or a couple dollars and some change. Now it costs fifteen, twenty dollars just to go eat a meal at the truck stop or a tip. The, the prices are getting ridiculous. The companies don't reimburse us anything. What would make things better as far as your life is concerned? Um, my dad always complains about some kind of EPA standard emission stuff. Um, I'm not too sure what it is, but for me, everything's fine. Are you making enough to support you and your family? Uh, I have to drive like twice more than uh, to make that same amount of money what I used to. You know, years ago, in 1974, 1978, uh, uh, 1983, there were some trucking uh, shutdowns. Truckers shut their trucks down, complaining about phony oil shortages, fuel shortages, uh, sometimes tax increases. Do you think a shutdown could work today if necessary? And if so, I mean, would enough truckers shut down to see if there would be change? Well, I, w I would go for it two heads up. For sure. I would go if there would be good organization to shut down whole trucking business and then uh, the government would see what, what it means to live without trucks. If they keep putting more regulations and keep cutting back on things, as far as the hours we have that they're talking about doing, then it's going to get worse for that. Because they, the, the money that, that I make now Basically, I was making 10 years ago. 
Well, that and, can't be good. No, it's not. But I was making good money 10 years ago. I'm still, I, I don't know how to, how to put this in perspective is I've been with Seaboard for 11 years. I've owned three new trucks. I started out with a used one and I've had three new trucks in 11 years and still putting money away to retire on. So if you're with the right company, the money's there, but if they keep putting the regulation and cutting the hours back on people, it's not gonna happen. You have to be in town between before midnight and you have to wait until the next midnight. If not, the first day you get home doesn't count. So you end up taking two days off instead of a day and a half. You know, some years ago, well before your time, 1974, 1979, 1983, there were trucker shutdowns in the country. It actually worked out pretty well to the benefit of those truckers, especially owner operators. If things got difficult, bad for you and others like you, uh, what do you think about another shutdown? Would that help you change it, things? It better? actually would. I mean, studies show if you shut a truck down, if you shut this industry down for two days, you're not going to get no groceries, you're not going to get your fuel, you're not going to get your electronics, because I haul the haz hazardous materials that can make up that camera that you're using today. And if you shut, shut us down, companies can't make their products, stores can't fill their shelves, yeah, rail can't get it to the store, they can get it to the town, they can't get it to the store. If, you, if a shutdown would take place under circumstances like that, who would lead it? Be someone from the organization, OOIDA, do you think, or...? The problem with getting it started is everyone talks about doing it. But, like I said, it's talk. You have to do it. You can't just talk about it. But you can't get enough of these guys to get together to say, okay, let's shut down. I mean, you get these trucks here, shut them down. Okay, but you still have everyone that's still on the road coming through and across the country that haven't shut down. So all the company's got to do is say, okay, you ain't going to take it. All right, I got a truck coming through there in two hours. Disconnect from the trailer, and you can bobtail home because you own your truck. You're done. You got to find another job. You know, you pull into a shipper or someplace, and they don't even want to talk to you. You know, it's just, what do I want to say, uh, in the way the prices are? If people would have stuck together back then, I don't think the prices would be as high as they are today. You know, on the fuel. But they know that the truckers are not going to unite. They're not going to stick together. Because you have too many ethnic groups in here now. You have the uh, Indians, or the Hindus, or then you have your Russians, you got your Mexicans. You know, I, I'm not prejudiced. I hate everybody equally. <laughs> you know, so I mean, and, and it, from their country to come to our country, I'd do the same thing. You know, to see the way they live over there, I would come over here and do this too. But they're coming over here and they're cutting their wages, cutting our wages because they don't know what the wage is. They figured, you know, it takes a guy a buck 30 mile to run out here with a brand new equipment. And they go out and buy this old junk, and, and it doesn't cost as much to run, so they can charge 70, 80 cents a mile. Which are they right now, like, Russian tra trucking company? Mm -hmm. This truck, what I owe right now, it has a rebuilt engine, a brand new transmission, brand new rear ends, 2000, year 2000, Volvo. Mm -hmm. And uh, next year I have to put at least 15 grand to to be legal on the road. It makes no sense to me at all. Now, you're, you're from Russia? Yes. H how long have you been in the country? Uh, 23 years. So, so far, so good for you? I you... mean, 23 years ago, I can tell you honestly, America was America. Right now, America is worse than Soviet Union. Why is that? Because the regulations kills businesses. That's what Soviet Union did to our country. They just shock people and follow the government's order. That's what Obama does right now with the country. He is not a legit man in the White House. That's what I see, because I live in that country. And I've seen what socialism does to people. 
equalize people, take from uh, rich, basically they rob the rich people when they, when they made the socialist revolution. They rob all the rich and spread the wealth. And for a few months as people was celebrating, but then starvation comes because nobody works. What they rob, they distribute and that's it. The party ended. That's what is gonna happen with America if that guy will not be somehow taken off from the White House. He's destroying country. Do you, do you see things getting better or getting worse? Getting worse because they're trying to change our regulations again and I don't it all goes back to the, the, the ones that are trying to make our laws and regulations don't have a clue as to what this is. They're just sitting there going, okay, it looks good on this piece of paper. It's just like dispatch sitting there going, okay, you're only 50 miles away from the stop. You can do it in 10 minutes. <laughs> That's true. You know, I mean, everyone's a millionaire on a piece of paper. But when you sit here and do it in real life, I mean, I, I, it's weeks on end where I don't see my family. It's, I mean, I've given up my wife and daughter two times and sent them to another country because I just couldn't afford it anymore. I mean, I've never been that way. I've never been scared that I was going to get a paycheck or not get a paycheck in the last couple of years I have. I mean, you get a field surcharge, but sometimes the field surcharge lags two weeks behind. So, while the fuel price goes up, that's more money out of your pocket. You don't see the comeback until like two, three weeks later. And then by that time prices go down and you get a little surplus in your pocket, it still balances out, but it's a, it's a roller coaster you're constantly chasing. There's an owner-operator organization called OOIDA. Is it familiar with our new member? No. Um, I guess I'm wondering if things would get more difficult for you, if things would be hard for you to make a living out there, would you be among the truckers that would agree to a shutdown in one word to be called for by a reputable other truckers. See, that's the problem with a lot of other people out here on the road. Unless you just got money in the bank to support yourself for several months on end, you can't afford to. And even as much as I complain that I barely make enough to sit there and keep this thing running, ain't nothing else out there paying any better. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? Hopefully not here, but I, I have a hard time looking out a year ahead at the moment. Things are just too volatile. Something got organized? Yeah. We need to shut America down with the trucks. Who would, who would organize that? I don't know. No one. There's no, it, there's no leader. Yeah, there's there's nothing. If you could change one thing that exists in trucking together uh, today, if you could change one thing for the better, what would it be? Get rid of brokers. Let us go direct to the customer. Because the brokers are taking a shitload of money right off the top, you know, and the guy that's doing the work is getting peanuts, mm -hmm. you know, so I mean, it's, that's what's the only thing i change, is let, you know, let us go straight to the customer, that's the only way you're going to do it, because these brokers are taking, you know, a load that pays two fifty a mile, they're putting it out on the load board for a buck a mile, a buck ten a mile, and I say that's not right, but then again, I guess that's American business. They sit there, when they came out with this new 34-hour reset and all this stuff a few years ago, I guess more than a few years now, but they thought it was going to hurt the drivers. We figured out how to get around it, and we really don't get around it. I mean, it's nice. I can run whatever and sit for a day and a half, do a reset, and I can run again. Computerized logs, I love them. As I understand right now, what uh, uh, EPA does to country, that's what this is called green movement. It's green outside, red inside. Mm -hmm. That's like watermelon. Mm -hmm. It's green outside, but red inside. It's filled with a socialist ideas, all that movement. This movement of EPA, it's not because of that. Idea is not to save people from the bad air. Air is good. What the whole idea of EPA? To crush businesses, to bring country to disparity. That's what socialism idea is. First, before the uh, government can control people, they can should bring people to disparity, to poverty, everyone. And then they will take, okay, now we will take charge of everything. We will tell you what to do and how to do it because we need to survive. 
That's what this president trying to do, bring people to disparity. He told uh, in his pre-election company, I will slash deficit in a half. So instead of 8 billion, what used to be uh, at, at the end of the uh, Bush presidency, supposed to be right now 4 billion. We have 18 billion. And he said, if I'm not slashing, I am one term president. That's his words. Is he man of integrity? Does he have some um, integrity what what he say? Does he have some shame what he said? And he just he just partying guy. In four years he had 18 vacations. In four years I had none of vacations. And he's always saying I am for poor guys. It just doesn't, I mean, doesn't come, uh, doesn't match with my mind. If he's for poor guys, he should be at least like cutting on some of his vacations. But he is party in president. Party after party. It just makes me mad. If he is not a president, if he, and his words just doesn't match with his actions. What makes him hypocrite. Now that you've seen the results of the shutdowns from 74, 79, and 83, I know that some truckers watching this are gonna say, yeah, we should shut down again. Big problem. Won't happen, can't happen, will fizzle. Not only because Obama, now in his second term, would crack down hard because not because he doesn't like truckers, but because he doesn't like fossil fuel, which feeds most trucks. So therefore, that would be an excuse to crack down on the truckers. Plus, there's no organization that would organize a trucker shutdown now. So if you are thinking, oh boy, why don't we shut down again? Trust me, it will not work and it would give a giant black eye to the entire trucking industry. So I hope you take this to heart because it's something that has been part of my life for a long time and I know part of the life of every trucker watching this documentary. Don't go away. This 61-year-old Kenworth sits proudly as a symbol of reliability for a 45-year-old dealership in America's heartland, Des Moines, Iowa. We're going to take you on a tour of Kenworth, Mid-Iowa. But first, let's meet the founder. I'm Rod French. We started uh, Kenworth, Mid-Iowa in 1968 full-service dealership for Kenworth Trucks. We service all duty, heavy-duty trucks, every make and model here at our facility. Our major goal is to provide service for whoever has a truck, whether they bought it here or not, after they have it. We take care of everybody. The only area of a truck dealership parts department a trucker usually sees is the counter and an employee who delivers the part. This presentation of Kenworth Mid-Iowa will give you a much more intimate look at their huge parts inventory. Not just a peek, but a thorough look at what it takes for a full service dealership to stock virtually anything and everything a trucker wants or a mechanic needs. Kenworth Mid-Iowa maintains a parts depot, an actual department store, stocking over 10,000 different parts. In this row here, these are our new Packard Engine MX parts. In this aisle, we have our Caterpillar engine, Detroit diesel, and also our transmission parts. And in this aisle here, we have our brake parts, brake hoses, driveline parts, and rear end parts. 
This aisle here, we have our Kenworth proprietary parts. We have chassis parts. We have grill parts. We also have, in this aisle, our Cummins engine parts, which includes injectors, rod and main bearings, oil pan gaskets, uh, emission control items for the new engines. Uh, we also have spring pins for the suspension, U-bolts for the springs. We keep a full line of ignition keys and keys. For today's trucker, we carry a full line of aftermarket lighting products, original equipment lighting products, suspension products, electrical products such as starters and alternators, and suspension parts. Here, on the second floor, dozens of truck seats patiently wait for a trucker who is very choosy about what model seat will carry him or her comfortably for another million miles. The second floor of Kenworth Mid-Iowa's parts department primarily stocks larger items, such as exhaust stacks, hoses, filters, and as you've just seen, seats galore. Here we see the incoming shipments area of Kenworth Mid-Iowa's parts department. If you have an older model truck and the fuel gauge finally died, the chances are that among those 10,000 parts sits the exact original equipment gauge. It might have waited for eight or nine years to be needed. Chances are Kenworth Mid-Iowa has that rear gauge on one of its shelves purchased many years ago just so your trip will be delayed as little as possible. Because Kenworth Mid-Iowa knows you can't make money sitting around, their parts and services open around the clock from Monday to Saturday. Yes, service and parts are open all day Sunday as well, opening as early as 7 in the morning. In a separate large building, an inventory of batteries is stored along with wheels, frame rails, bumpers, and items like kits, engines, transmissions, drive lines, and differentials. A large customer lounge, which you don't see in this presentation, features couches, television, and a working relic, a pay telephone. Kenworth Mid-Iowa features numerous work bays where virtually any problem can be repaired serviced or modified. No matter the brand, no matter the engine, Cummins, Detroit Diesel, Caterpillar, or Packard's revolutionary MX with up to 1,850 foot-pounds of torque and 500 horses. Kenworth Mid-Iowa is just 60 seconds off Interstate 80 in the western part of Des Moines. It's time to meet Kenworth Mid-Iowa Service Manager, David Lang, with important tips about service. Clean def is very important and here's why. And sensors on the exhaust system are monitoring the treatment of the exhaust at all times. If the def is not maintained properly, or the filter becomes plugged in the pump, then the treatment of the exhaust can be altered. Therefore, the engine light will be illuminated and the engine will soon become derated to a point where the truck can um, will become almost unusable or derated to five mile an hour. So that is why it's so important to keep your def fluid clean filters maintained properly, and an overall clean desk system will make the truck run more efficiently. DEF, diesel exhaust fluid, it's a solution that's used to lower the emissions on 2010 trucks and newer. It was mandated by the government to lower the emissions and to clean up the air. 
What we're here to talk about is the fluid itself also needs to be keep clean, kept clean while, while transporting or while it's being put into the truck. And we're also here to talk about a filter that's a little bit hard to find and not, not out and accessible as you might think and sometimes forgot about. The filter is located in the pump module, which is right in behind the DEF tank. This is the pump module. You can access the filter by unscrewing this cap. and pulling it out. This filter needs to be serviced at 300,000 miles. Personally, I would recommend service intervals before that, but that is the manufacturer's suggested interval. Simply buy a new filter, install it, and the system will prime itself after you've installed it. Here's a filter that's frequently forgotten. It's referred to as the coalescing filter. Basically the filter filters crankcase gases and or oil back into the engine so they do not get out into the atmosphere. One thing that should be considered is the engine duty cycle or its workload. If you have a higher duty cycle or a harder working engine, the filter can be serviced. What the filter recommended service is 125,000 miles. I, I would recommend if you have an engine that's a light duty or a lower duty cycle, not pulling heavy loads, maybe consider um, changing that filter more often. And the reason I say that is because the engine will build up moisture inside this filter. Basically condensation from inside the engine builds up in this filter and ca can cause it to plug. We take care of anyone that buys a truck, whether it's here or any other dealership. We want to make sure the customer is the most important thing in our mind because he's the one we go to. We have four of the stores in this area where we do service on the same scale. It's an important factor that we stay with it and make it work. If there's a question comes up, we may not have the answer, but we will find the answer. That is where we want to go and let them know that uh, our people are here dedicated to give them that type of service. Semi-Justice is an action-packed story. It's a book I just had to write. I also wrote the screenplay version, but it may never be turned into a movie because it reveals hidden facts about how much oil there really is in the world. For instance, did you know that in Venezuela, there's enough oil to supply the entire world for five thousand years? Yep, five thousand years. Hollywood's liberals, like the mainstream media, don't want you to learn that. But I do. In Semi-Justice, I explain why all the ports of entry are illegal. The Constitution spells it out in detail. So does Semi-Justice. In this book, you'll read about locked door government deals involving slimy oil billionaires. You'll read about a strange Hong Kong puppet master and his South China Sea oil, and his harem of beautiful, sexy massage therapists. The heroes of semi-justice are America's truckers. They convoy to Washington to end another phony oil shortage. In the process, they rally America to demand a flat income tax. Wouldn't that be nice? 
Truckers and semi-justice are mad as hell and won't take it anymore. Sound familiar? If so, you can buy semi-justice from Amazon's book page. Just go on Amazon and insert two words, semi-justice. The cover of the book, this cover, will pop up. You then click on it and you can read the first dozen pages or so for free. If you like it, you can buy it for less than the cost of a sandwich, $5.99. Even though Amazon says Kindle version, you do not have to have a Kindle. You can download the entire book on any computer, a PC or laptop, any computer. Then, since it's in your computer, you can read it anytime you want, such as during that stupid 34-hour restart, or when you get home. You'll see why it will be difficult to find a Hollywood production company to fund it. It's not politically correct, but it is packed with the truth, and truckers are hungry for the truth. Now, go to Amazon, Read this explosive story at your leisure. Thanks for watching and thanks for listening. I'm Mike Parkhurst, and you can reach me by email at semijustice at aol.com.